Uh, good morning. I'll be bringing you today's scripture, and we're reading from Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. For this reason, we must pay attention all the more to what we have heard, so that we will not drift away. For if the message spoken through angels was legally binding, and every transgression and disobedience received a just punishment, how will we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? This salvation had its beginning when it was spoken of by the Lord, and it was confirmed to us by those who heard him. At the same time, God also testified by signs and wonders, various miracles, and distributions of gifts from the Holy Spirit according to his will. What do you think decides the importance of a letter that you receive? Go out there and check the mailbox. Is it what is written in the letter? Or is it who wrote it? Or is the truth perhaps a little of both? But the reality is, when you get one of those white envelopes in the mail with the Queensland government logo on it, we open it with a little bit of trepidation. And we do so before we know what it says. We actually place a higher importance on the letter immediately when we see who wrote it. And this is, of course, because fines, speeding and otherwise come in these letters. And you might be about to open up to a hefty fine, at least this is what I've heard. Um, Then you open it, And it's like a reminder of an upcoming election that you have to vote in or something like that. And you're like, sigh of relief, wheelie bin, right? So there's an importance you place on it because of who sent it. And then, of course, the content as well has an impact on the level of importance we place. Other things, the sender might not be important. But for whatever reason, we pay careful attention to the content. I absolutely hang out for my quarterly Farmers Direct catalogue, and I read it very carefully, having never purchased anything from it. But I love it. And if you don't get that in your mailbox, you are missing out. Um, For whatever reason, I think it's important. I really enjoy it. It doesn't matter the fact that it's not sent by anything that's actually important to me. The real issue is if you ignore an important message from an important authority, now we're in difficulty. If you ignore an important message from an important authority, now we have a problem. I was at a friend's house once, this is many years ago, and we were sitting at the, at the house, and then there was a knock on the door, and we opened the door, and it was the police, and this is in Brisbane. And the police took the stepfather away from that family in the police car. And it was like, what is going on? Turned out, three years previously in Melbourne, he had run up all kinds of speeding and red light camera fines and figured, because he was moving to Brisbane, who really cares? It had taken three years, but eventually the cops turned up and said, you're coming with us. And he had to pay thousands of dollars worth of fines. The reality is you can only ignore an important message from an important authority for so long. And sooner or later, it catches up with you. That brings us to our passage today, which we are going to work through verse by verse. So, verse 1. For this reason, we must pay attention to all the more to what we have heard. What reason? Well, this links us straight back, of course, to chapter 1. Chapter 2 is directly tied into chapter 1. For this reason, the reasons given in chapter 1, we must pay attention to what we have heard. Now, as we saw last week, chapter 1 is about the superiority of Christ to angels. And it finished by saying that angels are ministering spirits sent out to serve those who are going to inherit salvation. Salvation is the key message, ultimately, of chapter 1. 
okay? Christ is superior to the angels. He's superior to the angels because he is the mediator of salvation. For this reason, we must pay attention all the more to what we have heard so that we will not drift away. Now, that is actually a very powerful image. In the original language, it's literally the words that we use to describe a piece of driftwood bobbing along on a stream, being gently carried away by a river taken to the destination of wherever the river is flowing, having no determination of its own, no control of its own, but just gently bobbing along in a stream, going to wherever the river is going. Now, I didn't live in Bundaberg in 2013. How many of you were here for the 2013 floods? Yeah, lots of hands going up. I remember uh, being in Newcastle and watching on the news and I remember this shocking image of a house that was kind of moving along the Burnett River, right? And, and every part of you goes, that's not right, okay? A house adrift of its foundation and moving along a river is clearly an indication that there's a problem. Okay, so we sat there in other states going, that, that's horrific. That is, like, we were blown away at what was happening up here. Well, Jesus says the wise builder builds their house upon the rock and not the sand. And what was the, the rock? What was the, the rock that we build on? And, of course, Jesus said it is the firm foundation of hearing his word and obeying it. Okay, this is the author's message to us. If you would avoid drifting away in your Christian faith, if you would avoid being that little bit of timber that's getting swept along away from the rock and getting taken to wherever the river is going, then you must anchor yourself to the Word of God. Not speculation, not false ideas, but to the Word of God. It's so important. There are so many little streams that flow everywhere that want to carry you away, aren't there, in your Christian walk? I remember this couple years ago. They got really caught up in spiritual warfare, right? So everything all of a sudden became about spiritual warfare. Everything was about some demon or another which had to be cut or negated. And one day I got a lift with them, and I was in the back seat. They were in the front and they got into an argument about which radio station to listen to. One was like, we want to listen to Triple J, the other one was Triple M, something like that. And, uh, and next thing you know, they are full-blown yelling at each other over which radio station to listen to on this drive. Until one of them all of a sudden said, hang on, we need to stop and negate the spirit of radio division. I kid you not. And I'm sitting in the back going, you need to grow up and stop being selfish. Because that's what the scripture would say, right? As a married couple, we are about loving the other person and, and putting the other person first. And that is your problem in the car, not the spirit of radio division. There are all kinds of streams which will carry you along. And if you are not anchored to the word of God, then you are free to be carried wherever the latest stream goes. Could be a false teacher, could be false practices, false culture, whatever it might be. If you are not anchored to the word of God, then you will drift according to the whims of the world. The root problem behind all of these things, as I said, is they are not anchored to the word of God. And the thing is, they might say they are. And that's what you have to be careful about as well. To be anchored to the Word of God means to know the Word in its context. It means to know the Word as God intended the Word to be understood. That's really important. To know the Word as God intended the Word to be understood. Not Scripture taken out of context, not a verse pulled out of here, but the Word given as God intended it to be understood is to be anchored to the Word of God. By the way, quick plug, 
this is the reason you should be in a home group. And the reason you should be in a home group is at a home group, most of them, they work through a study written about the sermon that I preach. And in a home group, you get a chance to work through the study together, to ask questions, to understand the passage. And you will hear someone in the group come out with an insight about this passage, which you've missed entirely. I'm the main teacher in the church. At times, I see you hear things in home groups where I'm like, yeah, I missed that. That's great. Word of God is speaking through that person in my group. Right? That is a wonderful blessing to your life to sit around together and rightly understand the Word of God. Okay, So this is the strength of being in a home group. Now, the reason the author starts this discussion in chapter 2 this way uh, is on the basis of talking about the angels. Um, he's going to give an example of what it looks like if we don't listen to the Word of God, what it looks like to drift, and that's how he set this up up, okay? And he does that by looking at the Old Testament. So verse 2, for if the message spoken through angels was legally binding and every transgression and disobedience received a just punishment. So what's the author saying, right? He's giving reference to the law being spoken by angels and this is a, a familiar understanding of the Old Testament. This is Galatians 3.19, the Apostle Paul speaking, he says, why then was the law given? It was added for the sake of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise was made would come. The law was put into effect through angels by means of a mediator. What does it mean? What, what, what are they saying about the Old Testament having been given through angels? And it's quite simple. It means that the message of the law came from heaven. That's the point. That's why it has authority, as our passage said, legally binding authority. Why? Because God gave us the Old Testament. And God's messenger is who? The angel. Right? So this is the point. God is the author of the Old Testament, and the law came through angels. They are God's messengers, right? Because of this fact, the Old Testament was legally Binding. God made a legally binding covenant with Israel. God would be their God. They would be his people. They would have no other gods before him. They would honor his laws and decrees. Amen? Is that the Old Testament covenant? Yes. Come on, let's wake up this morning. However, because it was a legally binding contract means if you break the contract, there's going to be penalty. Every, according to our passage in Hebrews, every transgression, transgression and disobedience received a just punishment. Question, how many people do you think were saved under the old covenant? I think very few. I think very few. What do we read as we read through the Old Testament? We read Israel being disobedient, God punishing them, Israel worshipping other gods, God punishing them, until eventually God's punishment is final. The whole ten northern tribes are conquered by Assyria and become the accursed Samaritans. The southern two tribes are conquered by Babylon and the temple is destroyed. This is the story of the Old Testament. So tell me, was God just in that punishment? Yeah, he was. Really, it's still a story of God's grace, wasn't it? I mean, when you read through the Old Testament, it's bleak reading. We just see continual disobedience, God's punishment and God's forgiveness. And we see it again and again and again, God's grace and mercy to idolatry, God's grace and mercy to dishonoring him in every possible way and grace and mercy piled on grace and mercy until finally God says, enough, I'm done, right? This is what we read. So is his punishment just? Yes. The legally binding covenant declared the death penalty was the penalty for idolatry, which was the main crime of Israel. 
God just in his punishment. So what about the new covenant? Right, so that's the old covenant. It was given by angels and it was legally binding. And so the author has built now to the new covenant to give us a warning. Verses 3 and 4. Think of what we've just read about the old covenant. How will we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? This salvation had its beginning when it was spoken of by who? The Lord. And it was confirmed to us by those who heard him. At the same time, God also testified by signs and wonders, various miracles and distributions of gifts from the Holy Spirit according to his will. If Israel was destroyed because they ignored God's message mediated by angels, how much more so if you ignore God's message of salvation, which comes directly from God in Jesus Christ? Amen? That's the message. There was a just punishment placed on those who ignored the message mediated by angels. There is a just punishment and far greater punishment that will be given to those who ignore the message given directly from God in Jesus Christ, the Son. If we determine the importance of a letter or message by the sender and by its content, then this is the most important message you can ever hear because it's the message of salvation given by God himself. You cannot ignore it. You cannot ignore it. Or the authority will catch up with you. We've just looked at the superiority of Jesus to the angels, and in that superiority, we see the superior messenger. Jesus is God in the flesh. His word is truth. If you have seen him, you have seen the Father. Of course, this message was given by the Son, but it was also authenticated with signs and wonders to, and the distribution of gifts to validate the message, to declare what God was doing. If ever there's a message directly from God, it is this one, which is, of course, the message of salvation, the gospel. Repent and believe for the kingdom of God is at hand was Jesus' message of salvation. Through his death and resurrection, he made atonement for those who accept him as Lord. Something else we learned from this passage was that the writer of Hebrews was not an apostle. For he says he heard it from those who heard it from the Lord. How will we ignore such a great salvation? Great because it's the legally binding contract given by God. Great because it's given, though, through grace. The old covenant was written on paper for sinful, rebellious people to try and adhere to. And as I said, very few did that well at all. And we're just so different from them, aren't we? I'm glad some of you got the irony of my statement. No, we're not. But the new covenant is written on our hearts and applied by the blood of Jesus. The old covenant was external law to keep. The new covenant is inward transformation done by the finished work of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Okay, this is the great salvation. You and me and every person are sinners in the eyes of God. We have all broken his contract and the penalty is death. You cannot pay back this debt. You cannot earn salvation. You might be a good person compared to the people around you. You might be a great person compared to the people around you. You might be more generous than everybody else, more helpful, more kind, more gracious, and yet the best that you offer is so far below God's standard, he says it's as filthy rags to him. The best you've got is nothing in the eyes of God's holiness. 
that's actually where our freedom lies. We're enslaved to sin, prisoners of death, and yet when we come to an end of ourselves, when we realize that we can't save ourselves, then we can put our faith in Christ who died and paid the penalty of your sin in your place. We then begin to slowly walk righteously as he continues your transformation from one degree of glory to the next. I've heard a couple of rumors, not said directly to me, but a couple of people have said to, to people in the church recently that some people have left this church because the teaching is too convicting or too negative. To think that, though, is actually to miss the truth of the gospel. And I really just want to zero in on this. We are saved by the death and resurrection of Jesus, by grace and grace alone freely given apart from works so that no one can boast. Full stop. I then fight against sin. On the basis of my salvation, I repent of sin. I call it out of my life. I discipline myself. But I am never, ever condemned because I'm saved by grace. The same goes for any good that we might do. Everything in our life is a response to Christ's salvation, not to earn it. It's because He has done it. I was a brand new Christian, and in the mid-90s, I was working on a trawler in the Torres Strait. Five months at sea, working seven days a week, 16 to 18 hours a day. Hard work. Didn't set foot on land in five months. Brand new Christian. Had a Bible. And an old Christian said to me, Sam, the whole time you're at sea, make sure you read your Bible every day. I said, okay. I never missed a day. I remember literally lying on my little bunk I had in the wheelhouse. And I think I got through about half of a verse. And then I woke up a few hours later and the page of the Bible was kind of stuck to the saliva on my lips. And I had to kind of pull it off my face uh, because I just kind of passed out with the scripture on my head. Um, Why? Why was I doing that? Well, it wasn't to impress anybody. The only other two people on the trawler were both new ages and they slept down in the cabin. There's no one up in the wheelhouse but myself. I knew it wasn't going to earn me salvation knew it wasn't going to do anything for me in terms of reward. I just loved Jesus because what he'd done in my life and I just wanted to know him. This is the Christian life. And it's the same with our struggles against sin. We don't do it to earn salvation. We don't do it to impress people. We fight because we are filled with the Spirit and because we want to honour God in the body. We don't neglect a great salvation. The truth is, if you're a Christian, you can come here every week and hear a rip-roaring, hard-punching kind of growl at your sin. And you should still not feel condemned. Because it is finished. He has done it. Let your weary heart rejoice. Right? That's our status. That, that's who we are. And because of that, because you are fini- uh, it's finished by Jesus, because it's been given to you by grace, it means that we can face the reality of our sin because we won't be condemned. Because we don't be- walk in shame and we don't walk in guilt, we don't walk in condemnation because Christ has won the victory. And so, yes, we get slapped around by the Word of God and we can bear it because we are saved by grace. So we can hear it and say, Lord, I want to be more like you. Challenge me, please. I want to deny sin in my life. I want to honor Christ on the basis of grace. Okay, this is the Christian walk. Let it encourage you to hear the Word of God. Wrestle with the Word of God. Let it challenge you. 
and keep marching forward. Again, I want to pick up on the impression here, you don't want to be that piece of driftwood drifting away, neglecting this great salvation. It's not an open rejection of Jesus. This is not the stand up one day and say, I don't believe anymore, I'm an atheist. This is not even persecution and under threat recanting your faith. This is the slow drift of someone neglecting their faith. Someone who is not passionate about God's word beginning to accept other words. Someone who begins to believe they can be a Christian without the church, Christ's bride. Someone who no longer finds the gospel enough and is slowly beginning to add things which are a bit more exciting and emotionally fulfilling. In the time of the writing of this letter, it was the drift back towards the old covenant, salvation through works. Under pressure and stress and growing persecution, these people were returning to what they knew. They were returning to their roots, which was not grace, it was law. Whatever our tendency or inclination, if we neglect our great salvation and get carried away, we will not escape the penalty of God's law if we neglect this salvation. Last week, we finished by looking at substitute saviors, those things we look to for salvation apart from Christ. This week, we need to ask ourselves, what are we neglecting that might lead to drifting away? Okay, what are we neglecting in our Christian life that might lead to drifting away? I've got three things. One, neglect of the word. The Word of God is our objective truth. It is completely infallible and the sole authority of our faith. If we hear someone teaching something that sounds nice, our question is still the same, is it in the Word in its context? When we see a church compromise and adopt worldly principles, we can call it out because our standard is the Word and not any other authority. If we let our feelings dominate, then we will begin to drift away from our great salvation. Two, neglect of the Spirit. We do not follow the triune God of the Father, Son, and Holy Scriptures. Right? As important as the Word is, is, as much as we must be anchored to the Word, we follow the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And if we grieve the Spirit of God, which the Scripture says we do by giving in to sin through pride and appearance of goodness rather than joyful obedience, we will begin to practice our faith according to rules to legalism, and we will move away from grace. If you ignore the Word, you can end up in all kinds of heresies, but if you ignore the Spirit, you will end up in legalism, trying to please God through rules and boundaries and judgment when we must sit under the grace of the Spirit who is conforming you to the image of Christ as you live out a life of love for Christ and fullness of the Spirit. Do not neglect the work of the Spirit. Three, neglect of the body. There is no such thing as a healthy Christian who doesn't go to church. There are Christians and backslidden Christians. Oh, I just find church false. I just find Christians annoying. I just find churches too institutional. Is another way of saying I just find that I'm full of arrogance and pride that makes me think I'm better than everyone else in that church. Right? That's the reality. How dare you? How dare you write off Christ's bride to think that you're better? That's horrible. Now, we have some older people, some unwell people, some very remote people who cannot make it to church. And I know for many of them, that's actually painful. And that's a good thing. It's a good thing because our hearts long and desire to be with the bride. 
church, do not think that we can neglect the bride and stay close to Christ. It's his bride. And the church is a part of his plan of great salvation. Remember, we are saved by grace. That is our message of salvation. And grace means that we can be honest about our weaknesses and mistakes and our sin. Grace means we can repent and move forward. If you identify where you've been neglecting this great salvation, repent. Change your behavior. Change your attitude. And move on in the freedom and forgiveness that Christ has won for you. If we choose to ignore this message, there is no escape from sin, there is no escape from judgment, and there is no escape from hell. Salvation is finished, completed by Jesus. But we must repent, believe, and we must honor his message. Do not neglect this great salvation. Let's pray. Lord, we all would know people who have drifted. We would all know those who have began to question your word and it slowly led to an unfaithful heart that has drifted away. Lord, we know people who have tried to go it on their own and they have drifted away. Lord, we know that if we neglect to focus on you, if we we don't keep pursuing your word and pursuing a relationship with you and, and honoring the spirit in our lives, we know, Lord, that we drift away. Lord, we pray that you protect us. Lord, may we not neglect our salvation, but may we give ourselves over to pursuing you. Lord, you are the goal of our faith. Our heart's desire is to be with you forever. Lord, may we live that now, pursuing Christ. Lord, may we as a church encourage one another, rebuke one another, hold one another up as we seek together to pursue Christ and to not drift. Lord, keep us strong, we pray. In your precious name, amen.